Family Matters. Welcome to another episode from our show, Family Matters. As you have followed me the last few months, Family Matters is geared towards every member of every family. Whether you are a kid, a parent, or even a grandparent, whether you are engaged or married, this show is for you. Today's show, I am very honored and privileged to have my friend and colleague, Dr. Christine Agaibi, who holds a master's and doctoral in counseling and psychology. She is have a specific focus in resilience and positive psychology. She holds and she runs the Center for Authentic Resilient Empowerment, teaches in Rowan University, and she has a private practice in Pennsylvania. Dr. Agaibi, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Great to have you. And the topic today, as we have indicated, is really my kid is not listening to me. And I want to start with a question that came throughout the past few days. A mother came home to find her son playing Fortnite. She already have told them that this is not a good game and is going to hurt you. This, the end of the story that they went into a major fight. Mom is very uh, frustrated. The kid was very angry. And at the end, both were misunderstood. And I want to ask you to begin by giving us at least the first few most important reasons why children, and we can actually pick in the middle age between, say, 8 and 18 or something, mm -hmm. are not listening to their parents. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are several, several reasons um, in that scenario that you listed there's a power struggle there. The child wants to assert themselves. They're going to lose much. If they lose this game, they're going to maybe lose their friendships or the level of the game that they have attained. Um, and it's important to see each other's perspective. So it's important that the relationship has been built, that there's been trust there. Um, and if the child is feeling criticized in this case, they're not going to listen. Um, this game is enjoyable to them. They're going to um, maybe lose a lot, like I just mentioned, because they are not um, playing this game with their friends or uh, at a certain level. Um, and at a certain age, in that middle age, as you're describing, uh, there's a lot of brain development that is still occurring. So there may be psychological issues there, but the impulse control center of the brain is still developing, developing and they may be getting something out of it. They may be um, getting excitement over it or enjoyment over it or even a social connection over it. So it's important to see all of those different factors that this child is trying to assert themselves. They're thinking about all the losses they're going to have, and they're not thinking that it's going to harm them. So you probably made at least, you alluded to at least two factors. One, mom may be criticizing mm -hmm. too much. Mm -hmm. And maybe the second reason, if I think you implied that mom never convinced her son that he's doing anything wrong. Mm -hmm. And and I want to pick on the second point. Mm -hmm. I mean, to tell you the truth, what do you think mom can or should do to convince her son mm -hmm. that screen time, which is one of the questions we both received, mm -hmm. um, is harmful, especially uh, a game night or a fortnight? Yeah, so a lot of times parents may think that if my child's not listening, this is disrespect, and it could be disrespect, but simply it could be that the message is being repeated over and over and over again that the, the child has just tuned you out. Um, you've given too many warnings without an actual consequence, um, and so they know that your promises are kind of empty in that regard. So it's really important that uh, the consequences are given that you're not yelling in the process because they're just going to tune that out. Um, the message is not too long. And especially with younger children, it's gotta be really succinct and short. And as the child grows, then your, your way of framing things has to change as well. Um, it's not just a, a simple consequence, but maybe explaining from a medical perspective, the 
uh, maybe not even from a medical perspective, but psychologically how this is, they're withdrawing from the family, how that can be harmful, how that can be difficult. Um, they're not really interacting with people in the real world. All they're doing is spending all their time on this video game. And you have to do it in a way that you're focusing not just on what they're doing wrong, but also the things that they could be doing right. So to get them to listen, um, maybe when they're playing the game is not the best time because now you're taking the game away. You're using repetition, yes, but again, not overly explaining it in the exact same way because they're going to tune you out. So those are just two of the things that we can do um, and offer them a choice. So instead of playing the game, let's go do this instead and offer them some, some alternative because just ripping this away from them is going to create a problem as well. So one of the things that you also implied, and I think you may agree that a lot of us parents, when they deal with their kids, they are saying too much. They are basically over speaking mm -hmm. and they repeat themselves. And, and I myself remember how annoying I could have been to keep saying the thing over and over and over again, because mm -hmm. I thought they didn't listen the first 10 times. So maybe that 11th time mm -hmm. would work. Mm -hmm. So you are saying too much. Yes, Talk to yes. me about how do I, as a parent, mm -hmm. say it in a way that's mm -hmm. not too repetitive, but in the same time stern and assertive, and I can reach my goal. Mm -hmm. Well, you have to be consistent. So every time they play the game, you can you can talk about the harms of it, but not in a critical way where you're putting them down or they're feeling criticized. And it also has to be packaged in a in a in a different way where you're also listening to them and then they are gonna to listen to you. So you have to model that behavior as well. So if you're on your phone 24 seven during dinner and doing all those things and you're not modeling the behavior that you want them to accomplish. So you have to model it, but at the same time, understand their perspective. Why are you on this game a lot? Are you escaping from something? Are you uh, not willing to study for an exam that is hard, for example? or you're talking to your friends through this game. And so maybe you need some more social time with those friends. So you also wanna educate them on balance. It's really important to have balance. You can play the games, but it should be at a shorter time and maybe focus your attention and energy on other things as well so that you're a well-balanced person. So the key is to listen to what is causing this problem. The game is just a symptom, but what is actually behind that, that could be an issue as well. Hmm. So you spoke of consistency as a parent, mm -hmm. um, and I think you are trying to say we as parents tend to be inconsistent in delivering messages. Mm -hmm. um, I want to take you to almost a little bit off the, this line, but not too far. Mm -hmm. um, when there are two kids in the family, and one of them is, you know, obedient, kind, submissive, everything. Another one is a little bit rowdy. He's, you know, hyper and all of that. And all of a sudden, I'm actually inconsistent because I have two kids and one message is said to the, the kid that I like more. Mm -hmm. um, how do I balance that in order for the hyper kid or mm -hmm. the rowdy kid uh, mm -hmm. listens to me? Mm -hmm. It's important to recognize that the rowdy kid, to use that word, is also um, also has some strengths. So their strengths uh, may be their love of learning new things, and that's why they're always exploring, or it seems like they're rambunctious, but they have other qualities. It's important as a parent to see each child as unique, but still as a family unit as well. So each child has their own strengths, and you have to speak to those strengths. Um, the child that is quieter or more obedient has that strength as well. And so we rely on that strength to help them to grow in that area. The child that is more um, rowdy or, or louder or not listening as much may have different strengths um, that, that they can use, maybe creativity or, or a love of learning, like I said. So it's important to figure out what each child's strengths are. Um, they have found 24 character strengths in people all around the world. Um, they can measure this from age 10 and up. So you can figure out and specifically understand what your child's strengths are and build on those strengths day to day 
so that you can um, guide them and mold them appropriately based on their strengths. Um, maybe again, the quieter child has self-regulation. They're very well able to self-regulate. And you can see this in their everyday movements. So again, you're building upon those strengths and that's what helps that child to mold because what I pay attention to is what becomes my reality. And if I pay attention to the difficult points of them, that is all I'm going to see in that child. If I see the good points and the strengths, that can be used to mold the weaknesses. So the, moving to another reason, mm -hmm. um, some kids will tell their parents, mom, you don't understand. And that's why they are not listening to me as a parent and because I don't see his or her point of view mm -hmm. and you alluded to this when you said regarding the Fortnite game mm -hmm. uh, honey I know how much you love the game mm -hmm. but and I can see that this is a very interesting game but I want you to continue that dialogue for me as a parent to learn from you Mm -hmm. How do I respond to the kid who assumes that I know nothing about the game and probably they are right. Mm -hmm. I know nothing about the excitement of the game, mm -hmm. but I don't see their point of view. How can, as a parent, mm -hmm. seize their point of view mm -hmm. and what type of language or dialogue you want to instill on me for, for me to make him listen or mm -hmm. listen, uh, herself to listen? Yeah, so from the child's perspective, they may see that you've never played the game, you didn't sit and watch me play the game, you heard something from a third party or from an article or from a TV show or from whatever, and assume that this game is bad. However, the child may see it as something different. Like I said, they may see it as this is the way I'm playing with my friends or talking to my friends or having my social engagement. So sit with them as you would um, if you were watching a show. I used to watch shows with my parents and we would have discussions about them. This is the same kind of idea. Even if you don't agree with the game, and maybe even the game is not good, if you sit with them and try to understand their perspective and try to see where they're coming from, maybe you'll have a better understanding of their thinking process, and then you can, you can tackle those points from the inside, as opposed to all they're seeing is you're looking from the outside in, you don't understand it, and you're trying to judge it. So again, it's about listening. It's about understanding their mindset, understanding where their point of view is. They may still be wrong. It may still be a poor game, but at least this way you're arguing from a point of understanding as opposed to a, a, a point of a stern parent who is saying no means no. And sometimes you do have to say no means no, but understanding their perspective of why they like this will help you argue it better. Hmm. Okay, can you talk to us about Sometimes we dilute our uh, words mm -hmm. by not just repeating them, but mm -hmm. by going about it in so many ways. But we we just, I mean, sometimes your kid will say, mom, I got it. I got it from the first time you told me. Mm -hmm. We as parents, and I, I share in that, we tend to repeat ourselves so much. And sometimes we think that this is the best way to parent our children. Mm -hmm. I want to learn from you, what's your tactic and what do you teach in counseling? Yeah, I mean, it, repetition is okay if it's um, still reaching the level of their understanding. If you're just repeating and you're a broken record, as they say, that becomes a problem because all they're here, they can, they can tune that out, right? So they have to acknowledge that, that they have received the message. So have you understood why I've said what I've said? Have you understood? Um, and again, when they're younger, it has to be short and succinct. Their attention span is really short too. As they get older, they may have more philosophical discussions or more hypothetical thinking. Their thinking is not just black and white. So you have to expand on what you're saying and why. Um, so active listening is, um, when they're speaking to you, you can say, I have heard you say X, Y, and Z. And then when they, when they are talking to you back, they can say the same things. Mom, I understood you saying this, or dad, I understood you saying this. Um, and that becomes kind of second nature, that I've understood what you said, I've repeated it. It's called active listening because I've acknowledged the points that you've mentioned and why they're important and how they can be applicable in your life as well. Beautiful. Okay. Um, 
one of the questions that came is circling around, which is, I think, a common occurrence in every home. My kid doesn't want to, you know, to put his stuff in the cupboards. His room is very uh, untidy. Um, and I have told him many times, basically engagement of cooperation of the kid. Mm -hmm. How do we get our kids to listen to us in cooperating in some sort of disciplining towards house chores, at least his room um, being tidy? Yeah. Yeah, that's a very common problem. And usually uh, with teenagers and preteens and that uh, puberty age, maybe to high school age, there's a lot of this back and forth, especially about chores or doing homework or these kinds of things. And uh, parents get into the habit of saying, you never clean your room, or you always do this, or uh, compare them to another sibling or a cousin or something like that. So those become problematic behaviors because they're going to, they're going to, it's going to become a, a self-fulfilling prophecy. Well, if mom always sees that I never clean my room, I'm never going to clean my room. So we want to get away from those always and never kind of scenarios and focus again on times where they have cleaned their room. Um, so I noticed last week when I asked you to put this away, you listened the first time and try to acknowledge it right away when it happens because it registers right away. Today, you, you came back from soccer and you put away your shoes and you put away your things. I noticed, I acknowledged that behavior is going to increase because I praised it. I talked about it in that moment. We also want to understand that kids at this age, there's still a lot of developmental things that are happening. They look like adults or more like adults than they were when they were five but they're still developing. There's still a lot of developing going on, including information processing, including things like organization, including speed of doing things. So that stuff is still developing, believe it or not, all the way till the early to mid twenties. Um, and so we have to be patient with them at the same time. That's why repetition is important, but not repetition with yelling, not repetition with too much pressure, none mm -hmm. of those things. It is more about teaching and guiding and molding. And think about times in your own life as parents when you didn't listen, were you distracted? Were you upset about something else? And your kids are probably going through the same, but they're processing a lot of stuff in a short amount of time. So you brought a very uh, common issue that I think a lot of parents and kids suffer from, which is really yelling. Mm -hmm. The whole house is a bunch of yelling people. Uh, mom for the last six times her daughter didn't listen to her because she was whatever she's doing mm -hmm. so she her tone of voice keeps rising up and up and she became a more soprano and then the kid sort of raises her voice and then the mom gets angry because the kid raises her voice mm -hmm. yelling um i mean when you ask the parent why you're yelling they will say because they didn't listen Mm -hmm. because I told him five times so I had to increase my voice the sixth time mm -hmm. what is that what is the yelling doesn't do mm -hmm. and how can I replace the yelling by a more um, constructive and positive strength that I can impose on my kids that I don't have to reach the level of uh, yelling yeah unfortunately it can be a common thing it's not the best way to deal with things um, I think people are trying to get somebody's attention when they're doing that, um, but the child initially can become jarring. Eventually, they tune it out because it's so jarring. Um, as a parent, you need to acknowledge that you're frustrated. I'm frustrated that I've said this 10 times and nobody has listened. And maybe saying that, I, I've said this exact thing 10 times and you still didn't pick up the socks off the floor. And that's frustrating. Acknowledge that as a parent. Acknowledge that you're human. You've made a mistake and then say, how can we approach this together to make this a little bit better? So make it a collaborative effort. If I put my socks in the hamper or I do this a different way, maybe you will listen. Um, also acknowledging that they have strengths that again are, are hiding and we have to reframe away from the things that are not working to the things that are. So mm -hmm. last week I noticed that you put those things away. What was working that day that helped you to put it away? Were you less distracted? Did you have less homework? Was somebody listening to you um, that day and now you're, you're listening to me? What caused you to listen that day so we can increase those behaviors and get away from the not listening so everybody is calmer? Again, what I pay attention to becomes my reality. So I like very much that, that you always remind the kid with the positive 
Mm -hmm. uh, that he or she did and the strength that he or she has mm -hmm. um, before you criticize. And uh, I know that you and I spoke that the strength-based parenting needs to be a whole episode by itself. Yes. I have this question that just came, so let me just address it and see what you think. Mm -hmm. um, my kid will say no even before I ask, and I have to threaten with punishment and enter into discussion. Mm -hmm. How can I get my child to stop saying no? Mm -hmm. No is a way to assert their strength. Because even if they're five years old, they want to be heard. They want their opinion to be understood. They want to do things their own way. One of the first words we learn is no, even as two-year-olds. Um, and so they want to assert their strength and their point of view, whether they're five or 15 or 50. So understand that they have a point of view. Listen to that point of view. You still have a right as a parent to, um, to say no to something. Sometimes there's natural consequences that come with things, and sometimes there are consequences that you have to lay down that you've said many times that you're going to do it, you have to just do it. But the more collaborative the process is, the easier it'll be to be heard and to be listened to, and that both parties are respected. Um, kids that have a lot of rules in their life, but is also having a lot of love and respect, it goes both ways. Respect is a two-way street. Um, whatever you, you sow, you will reap. So if you're giving your child respect and hearing them, they will do the, hopefully the same back to you. Um, and the more that it's a collaborative process, but you're still the parent, you're still the head of that household, you still have the rules, um, they will understand that a lot more. Yeah. And I think um, we may, may also like to comment on mom's point about threatening. Yeah. That's usually very demeaning and uh, usually doesn't accomplish much mm -hmm. and especially that most of your threats are more than likely are empty threats you are not going to actually do what you have threatened mm -hmm. your son to i know i i will kill you i will return you back to egypt i mm -hmm. i will keep you for the whole night without food mm -hmm. so at the end of the day a lot of our threats, when they are empty, we actually lose more grounds mm -hmm. and we look like we don't know how to parent. And mm -hmm. I, I think you you like to comment also on the use of threats. And uh, I think she said threats with punishment. Mm -hmm. So I like the word discipline more than the, the word punishment. Punishment um, is demeaning, like you said. Um, it is harmful to people's self-esteem. Discipline is more about teaching, about molding, about um, creating a relationship where you understand each other's point of view and each other's perspective. Discipline does not mean there's no consequences. There should be consequences. If you said, I'm going to have limits on these uh, tablets and devices and things like that, it's okay to take those things away temporarily. You know? But the consequences, again, you know, talk to them about it beforehand. You know the rules and what breaking those rules is going to result in um, so that there is no surprises at that end. You're not demeaning, you're not putting down, you're not criticizing or breaking someone's spirit. You're doing this as a way of discipline, which means to teach and to grow and to help to mold them. Yeah, and I always like to tell parents, each one of us has a contract from... AT&T or T-Mobile or Verizon mm -hmm. or whatever. And in the contract, they will give you two or three warnings before they actually yeah. cut off your line. Right. So it's very important you pre-warn mm -hmm. and even make a contract before mm -hmm. um, you, you, you decide on snatching an iPad from your mm -hmm. kid's um, mm -hmm. uh, hands. Mm -hmm. um, I want to make a, a scenario and I want to see if you can play it with me if you may mm -hmm. um let's say i am your son i am eight or ten i need to have a shower and i have been saying no mm -hmm. and you keep saying it's shower time mm -hmm. um you have to go you have to go and mm -hmm. i'm saying later later mm -hmm. how do you convince me to mm -hmm. do it mm -hmm. Yeah, so again, it's important to talk about things like the importance of hygiene. Um, and children that age may not understand the importance of that. There may be natural consequences where people start 
kind of separating away from them because of hygiene issues. So unfortunately, there will be natural consequences to that, which we don't want them to experience. We don't want people to separate from them because of those things. But again, educating them is really important. Here is the importance of hygiene, why hygiene is important, what happens to different ages when there is no hygiene. Um, and then again, if they're not listening, there is a contract, like you said before, I'm gonna take the tablet temporarily until you have accomplished those things. But again, there's going to be natural consequences maybe even before that, where people are starting to notice the lack of hygiene. That becomes problematic. Hmm. Would you would you be accepting a scenario like this? Okay, sweetie, um, would you like to have a shower now? He says, no. Okay, so would you like to have a shower now or in 10 minutes? Mm -hmm. He says, okay, in 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. So we shake hands with each other and say, okay, uh, you promise, right? Mm -hmm. man to man or mm -hmm. uh, i'm speaking now to the man that he's 10 years old mm -hmm. he says yes mom 10 10 minutes mm -hmm. and probably at eight minutes mark i'll give him a warning mm -hmm. okay according to our promise you have two minutes to go mm -hmm. um, and then at 10 minutes whatever he's doing needs to be stopped oh, yes, uh, yes are you okay with something like this yeah, because that gives them the sense of control back. Again, it could be a control issue. Um, you don't want to get into a power struggle. That's not going to be productive. But you did give them that choice. You gave them 10 more minutes. Maybe that diffuses that power struggle a little bit. If they don't comply at 10 minutes, there has to be a consequence because that was the agreement. Then tomorrow you don't have your tablet for half an hour less or something like that. Hmm. And and can you can you touch upon the non-negotiables though mm -hmm. when do you as a mom as as a counselor mm -hmm. teaching moms but at least as a mom first mm -hmm. when do you come down very clear and very strict and assertive and no negotiations mm -hmm. tell me about non-negotiables how do you how do you carry yourself as a mother yeah, hopefully you've explained these non-negotiables to your children, things like lying or being sneaky or doing things that are against your values as a family. Um, those things tend to be non-negotiables because they're much more serious than not taking a shower, let's say, or um, you know, they're, they're against the value system or something that you're trying to build morally in your children. But again, something morally that is being built, morality is something that is growing and developing as well. In fact, before, before age nine or so, morality is really about um, avoiding punishment or avoiding or getting a reward of some sort. After age nine, morality is much more philosophical and this is the right thing to do. That becomes the mentality. So mm -hmm. if you're broking, breaking these rules of these more larger philosophical values, that is something that is truly non-negotiable and needs to be taken much more seriously because that becomes who you are as a person, not just not taking a shower and not just not doing your homework. Obviously those things are wrong and need to be molded as well. But when it's something related to morality or your values, that is much more serious and has to be taken as such. That doesn't mean that you demean, doesn't mean that you break their spirit or anything like that, but it needs to be taken much more seriously. Yeah. And I want to, if you don't mind, add some of our non-negotiables should be all the godliness mm -hmm. venues. Um, you're going to liturgy tomorrow mm -hmm. or you have to read the Bible tonight. Mm -hmm. In other words, I, I feel like sometimes we are a bit hypocritical mm -hmm. that we lay down the non-negotiables about the homework and about uh, lying and about respecting and which are all excellent. Mm -hmm. But I think we parents sometimes leave the godliness and the godly ways that we want to teach our kids to grow in mm -hmm. um, to the church. And, mm -hmm. and of course, the church is important, but not as, not as important as what they learn from you and dad at home. Mm -hmm. And I think we as parents trying to learn parenting, right, mm -hmm. we really need to lay down some negotiables, non-negotiables regarding mm -hmm. the, the, how to respect the house of God, how to be ready for uh, communion and um, when they grow up a bit, confession and so on. Mm -hmm. Any comment from you as a mom also about this? 
Yeah, as a mom, I definitely uh, put those and instill those values in my own kids that it's important to read the word of God because it is applicable to every day. It's not just stories or words on a page. It truly is applicable in our everyday lives. And it's important for many reasons, including our, our afterlife and, and things like that. Um, so again, those values are really important to instill in our children, that respect for um, other people, respect for God, the house of God, the, the clothing that you wear, um, all of that is a part of the um, makeup of who you are. Yes, they, we you know, don't have to fight every battle or choose our battles, as they say, but there are truly things that are non-negotiable. Um, that need to be addressed. And every single time that those things happen, they need to be addressed. That's the consistency part that we talked about, because we learn from repetition, even as adults, the things that we learn, we learn through repetition. So we have cool. to do it over and over and over again. Question came, I think, I guess, when I brought the shower, another <laughs> parent uh, resonated with her. Mm -hmm. My daughter have hard time with shower. And the reason she doesn't like to comb her hair. I try different creams, bubble bath, etc., mm -hmm. things to make it easier, but she's still, uh, the shower struggle is ongoing. I know that you have two beautiful daughters. Mm -hmm. uh, you probably can be the person who answered this the best. Yeah, again, this is a common issue with um, adolescents and tweens and teens, and, and hair is often an issue. Acknowledging that it is an issue, um, acknowledging that that is part of the reason that they may not want to shower. They don't like tangles. I know my kids don't like tangles in their hair. So creams are important. Maybe take them to, um, I've taken them to salons that, that, that can teach them how to brush their long um, curly hair. I know that is a big thing in our culture, the curly hair. So if they can learn to take care of it correctly, they may be willing to do it um, more likely. They more be more likely to do it. So professionals can help. There's professionals in this area as well. Um, using tutorials even on YouTube or things like that can help. Talk about your own struggles with your own hair as a mom. Um, I'm sure we all as women have had struggles with our hair at some point or another. So that makes you a human. It makes you not just mom, this authoritative figure, but someone who has struggled as well, because it is about being a good role model. So yeah. doing it from that perspective, and um, they may be ashamed if they don't know how to do it, uh, may feel some guilt. So teaching them the right way may help as well. Yeah, great, great answer. And I want to, uh, again, add a little bit that um, it's very important while we're doing all of this that we don't compare her hair with her sisters yep. or her cousin. Mm -hmm. uh, and we do not put her down that she has an ugly or uh, I don't know what type of other words some moms may say when they get very angry with trying to comb mm -hmm. a hair that's uncombable in the beginning. Mm -hmm. I like very much that you brought up the idea of um, outsourcing, mm -hmm. almost uh, getting your daughter to a hair salon who specializes in this mm -hmm. and make you and your daughter, both of you learn how to care for a difficult hairdo. Yeah. Um, she's going to have her hair all her life. Mm -hmm. She still have another eight years to carry her hair. So mm -hmm. it's about time to learn from it now. Mm -hmm. Should it be longer or, or tall? Should it be use that type of shampoo or not? Should it be, um, I don't know what type of other bath? Um, mm -hmm. I think um, parents fight over bath in general, whether for boys or girls. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the hair is a constant uh, issue with moms, at least mm -hmm. in many homes. Mm -hmm. But please do not, moms, please do not make this a war. Do mm -hmm. not make your daughter hate that event because mm -hmm. you are really, at one time, she is going to do her hair alone. Mm -hmm. So at least do not be her. Do not make yourself become the hated person yeah. because you always give her pain. And it's mm -hmm. a, maybe you want to tell a story. Maybe you want to make her do your hair and you, you do her hair. And I know what you what other games you can do. Mm -hmm. But uh, certainly, uh, we don't want this to be a hated exercise. Yeah, absolutely. Christine, any other thoughts about this? Yeah, it's just important to get help wherever you can. It's okay to ask for help. It's okay if you don't know all the answers. We're not going to live long enough to know the answers to everything. So get help from other people. It's okay. Um, even other family members who have similar hair or something like that. But 
it's okay to ask for help. Yeah. Uh, I want to move to a different point, which is related to when mom and dad disagree with each other and how that affects the kids listening mm -hmm. to them or to one of them. Mm -hmm. Parents are going to disagree. They may not always see things eye to eye, but they need to see things eye to eye before they present it to the kids. They have to be united in how they present it to the kids. So the parents... It's okay to say to your child, we're going to talk about this. We will come back together and figure this out. Um, and it doesn't mean that we're going to have an answer immediately. And it doesn't have to be answered immediately. It's okay to take time to think about it, to talk about it, to collaborate as parents, to put your heads together and get to the resources that you need together, to do whatever research you need to do to pray about it, and then present it to the kids. I've heard of some families that even have family meetings just like you have a meeting at work so that you all are on the same page. Um, so we, I, uh, at the practice I work at, uh, we have meetings every single Thursday so that we're all on the same page with the policies of the practice and everybody, everything that is coming down the line. So do the same thing in your family so that you're all seeing things at the same page. You can have discussions that are open with one another. And that way all of the issues are out on the table. The mom and dad can talk about it separately um, come up with a plan, present it at the next family meeting together, and that way you have decided and are on the same page with each other. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, another area that I think to, to really comprehensively cover the topic of my kids do not listen mm -hmm. is actually the reverse. My parents are not listening. Yes. Um, he wants them, he wants to tell them something. Mm -hmm. He had a fight in the school. He was bullied. Mm -hmm. um, by someone because of his last name or accents or mm -hmm. hair or um, she had a crush on a boy and then she found the boy doesn't care about her she's coming home very upset and down and angry and crying tearful mm -hmm. and she wants to talk and or she's just angry at whoever in front of her so she became angry at her mom without mm -hmm. the reason and her mom basically discipline her by putting her in her room I think I want to almost put all of what I said in one topic mm -hmm. when parents don't listen mm -hmm. how do we how do we help our kids to talk to us mm -hmm. and how do we listen mm -hmm. and how do we never mm -hmm. stop that pathway yeah you, you don't want there to be a gap between you and your kids. They have to be able to come and talk to you. However, parents are human. Uh, talking to your kids after a nine-hour day at work or a 10-hour day at work is not the ideal time. Um, if something is urgent, you're going to have to, you know, kind of put the effort together. But it's always important to make them feel important and heard. And if you are distracted yourself because you're tired, because you're hungry, because you've had a long day, because you haven't slept all week, that is not going to be a healthy time to talk to them. So tell them, I am tired, I am hungry, I need a shower first, I need to take a nap, something like that. But at eight o'clock tonight, no matter what, I'm gonna talk to you. So you've given them that time and you're giving them the space in your mind to be able to speak to them as well. Um, and it's important not to discipline your kids for just having feelings. So if they had a bad day and you're disciplining them because they have feelings about their bad day, that is not a good thing. Feelings are an indication that something is wrong. So let's try to figure out what's wrong and tell them I'm here to talk to you when you're ready to talk, when you are calmer, when you've processed, when you are ready to kind of to have a conversation about this. I am here, I'm ready to listen, I'm willing to listen. And sometimes they just need to come off of whatever they're dealing with before they're able to kind of communicate that. I've had that happen with my, I have twins that are 13 years old and I've had that happen with my own kids. They don't even know what they're feeling and they can't talk about it yet. So don't punish them for that. Give them the space to breathe and think and then they will come and talk to you. And that's always happened with my kids. Hmm. Nice, very good answer. Um, I, I have to touch on this. Um, how about the kid that doesn't want to go to church? Mm -hmm. and his mom or his dad are so scared they are losing the kid doesn't want to be um, a deacon anymore mm -hmm. he hates to be a deacon um he finds liturgy too long mm -hmm. um 
you know, the word of boring, 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 every kid saying. Mm -hmm. And of course, mom and dad feels that they are losing the salvation of their kids, God forbid, and, and they get crazy over it. Mm -hmm. um, and then all of a sudden, Sunday morning at eight o'clock becomes a, a battle. Mm -hmm. Who is wearing what? Why are you still in your pajama? Why mm -hmm. we're not in the car yet? Who is going early? I need to be there. Mm -hmm. And they are not listening. Everybody wants to do whatever they are doing. And at the end, the church became almost a disciplinary uh, mm -hmm. event. Mm -hmm. um, how, how do you see that in your household or the households you deal with? And how do we work around this problem? Yeah, unfortunately, that for a lot of families that Sunday morning does become a struggle. Um, they may be tired from the week, they want to sleep, understand again why they don't want to go to church. Did someone bully them? Did they, um, someone say something to them that hurt their feelings? Try to understand it again from their perspective and explain why this is a value for your family. And again, you are a person that has to model this behavior. You have to be ready at eight o'clock to leave. You have to be dressed in the, in the appropriate way for church. You have to be ready mentally and emotionally to go to church as well. And if it's boring, it's important to explain how this touches their lives um, and why it is important in their lives. Maybe they're going through a struggle right now with something at school or whatever it is, and there's a verse or a story or a sermon that can be applicable to what they're doing. Um, and it's not just going through the motions. It has to be explained from a perspective of, this is going to be meaningful for me. And this, these are the reasons why it is meaningful. Hmm. There is a question that came. I am not 100% sure I understand it mm -hmm. correctly, but I'll try to um, read it. Mm -hmm. My child wants me mm -hmm. to limit my phone time mm -hmm. when I limit his iPad time. Mm -hmm. Is that okay? And then the next part is the difficult part. And if the shirt, if his shirt is ruined, he wants to ruin mine too. Mm -hmm. I think the kid is trying to punish the parent back. Mm -hmm. I I read it as is and okay. you tell me what you think. It, it's interesting to maybe hear how old this child is developmentally because there's developmental ages. Um, the limiting that is often... Uh, they start understanding hypocritical behavior, let's say, in the tween years. Um, that I, mom is telling me to do this or dad is telling me to do this, but I'm, I'm not doing that because they're not doing the same thing. So that really starts in the tween years. So I'm curious to understand how old this child is, but I'm thinking if they're understanding hypocritical behaviors that may be with the age that they are. It's important to explain why you are on your phone Maybe the parent is using it for work purposes. Maybe they're responding to emails. Um, there are, you know, like Ecclesiastics says, there's time under the sun, um, a time for everything, a time to do this and a time to do that. So explaining that to your child is important too. If it's dinner time, then the parent maybe and the child, everybody puts their phone away. Um, if the parent is a physician or something like that and they have to be on call, that is very different than a child. Um, that is on their phone all the time. So explaining why they're using their phone may be a little bit different, but understand that children understand hypocritical things. Um, the, the shirt part is a little confusing indeed. If the parent um, purposely harmed their, their child's belongings, then the child may feel that revenge, of course, because nobody should ruin my things. So now I wanna ruin other people's things. Um, so again, if you've made a mistake and that's the reason that's being explained, say you're sorry to your child and explain how you'll do things, uh, you know, better. Um, but if their, if their shirt was ruined kind of by accident, then, you know, explaining it's not, you know, you, it, you understand that they're hurt and it's upsetting and, and whatever it is, understanding their feeling once again. But that doesn't mean that the other person has to suffer because they've suffered, but you do understand their feeling and why they're hurt and why they're upset over this over this shirt. Hmm. I like what he's saying about uh, modeling or role model. Yeah. Um, and it's very important. I'm speaking here to parents. Mm -hmm. um, please do not ask something of your kid that you yourself is not planning to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and that applies to everything. Mm -hmm. The dad who wants to watch the game 
mm-hmm. and he's ignoring every single one in the family and then the mom is trying to snatch the phone from her kid mm-hmm. uh, of course it's hypocritical mm-hmm. and if the kid is very respectful he will not say anything mm-hmm. but if he's just a, a normal kid he will say what about dad mm-hmm. um and and then we went, we go into we don't know who's supposed to respond because at the end of the day, if we do not role model, Mm -hmm. um, there is very little we can parent. Um, The second point about modeling is, remember guys, that this is a gift that God has given you. Mm -hmm. And this gift is probably the most important investment in your life. Mm -hmm. And if it takes you to stop using your iPhone or or remote control, or I don't know what else, Mm -hmm. for you to role model your kids, Mm -hmm. then you better be self-controlling, control yourself and be willing to sacrifice this time in order for you to have a time with your children. Number three, I think we all lost with technology the time that we talk with each other. And I think uh, Dr. Agaibi is making it very clear that there are dinner time when, unless it's really emergency, the phones are not on the table, the iPads are not on the table, Mm -hmm. and everybody's talking about their days and the plans and the future and expectations and the fun things and the not fun things. Mm -hmm. But um, please do not try to be the adult who can is allowing to ha- is allowed to have exceptions because mm-hmm. that doesn't work and if you do have exceptions then actually the exceptions should be the rule mm-hmm. either everybody should be doing what you're doing mm-hmm. or you actually lay it down and say i am wrong i am sorry mm-hmm. exactly as dr christine just said mm-hmm. i i should have not y- used my phone now i'll mm-hmm. put it away Let's mm-hmm. enjoy time. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to say that Steve Jobs, in a, in an interview, um, who is the owner or the founder of Apple, had an interview in New York Times. Mm-hmm. And I think the title was a Steve Jobs fam- has a low-tech family. Mm-hmm. And basically, the, the interview mentioned that Steve Jobs mentioned that although they, he has multiple iPhones, they are not allowed to be used during dinner. Mm -hmm. So if that happens with the founder of Apple, I think we should humble ourselves and be uh, better uh, in the way we expect from our kids. Mm -hmm. Dr. Christina Gaibi, um, thank you so much for your time today. I really enjoyed your presence and I'm sure every single one benefited from your experience. I'm sorry we started a little late today, but I want to respect your time and the time of the audience. I hope you don't mind if I ask upon you to join me in future episodes. It'd be my honor. Thank you for having me. I appreciate this conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much for everyone. Uh, I hope you enjoyed Family Matters. Please continue to send your questions. That's how I learn how can I direct the coming episodes. Until next time, have a great week. God bless.